So Esther chapter 8, the scroll of Esther. It would seem that everything is done and dusted in Esther. That Haman has met his just ending, that he's been hung in the gallows, and Mordecai has been glorified and he's going through the streets. And, and it would seem like, well, what's the point in the next three chapters? The whole thing's done and dusted, but it really isn't. It really isn't. And there's something here that all of us have to grab hold of. For all of us, for our lives independently and for the church corporately, there's something really important here. So it says, On that day, I'll, I'll say King Xerxes, gave the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Now just to say, you are not, it's incredible. The term the Jews and a reference to the Jews in the last three chapters, bearing in mind that chapter 2 is very, very short, there is 42 references to the Jews. Do you understand why? So right at the end here, the author of Esther wants everybody to know the Jews are still alive. The Jews, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. As you go through, you see again and again, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. It's, there's an overemphasis almost because the author wants you to know that the genocide that was planned didn't happen. And so the Jews, the enemy of the Jews to Queen Esther and Mordecai came before the king for Esther disclosed uh, what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken away from Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai and Esther and set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Incredible reversal. But this is the verse. Then Esther spoke again to the king, fell at his feet and wept and implored him to avert the evil scheme of Haman the Agagite and his plot which he had devised against the Jews. Why is this so important? Because generally speaking in life, and this goes for all of us, when we ourselves are in jeopardy, we pray with fervency. That's what people do when they're in jeopardy. They pray with fervency. It's natural. When your life is in danger, you discover a new spiritual realm. You find that you're closer to the Lord than you've been perhaps at any other time. But there are very few people that can maintain that intensity for others. And what you see here with Esther is that just because Esther's safe, just because Mordecai's safe, it's not over, folks. There's, there's 127 provinces where the Jewish people are going to be slaughtered. And Esther knows she's safe. That's a done deal. She knows that Mordecai's safe. That's a done deal. Most Christians, most Christians will find a new place of prayer, a new place with the Lord when they themselves are under attack. But there are so few that will stand in the gap for others. There are so few. This shows me the caliber of this queen. What an incredible woman. And I want you to notice here that she falls at the king's feet. Do you understand what's going on here? Do you understand in terms of where we are at today, what's going on here? Does it register to you what is going on today around the world? What is going on here? Esther's falling at the feet of the king, weeping. Why? For herself? No. She's okay now. For Mordecai, no, he's okay now. For the Jewish people. For the Jewish people. Because some people have the discernment to know 
that if there is ever a global genocide of the Jewish people, it's an absolute guarantee. Catastrophe will follow for everyone. And there are so many Christians that do not understand that. And so we have, and I cried this week, I wept tears when I looked at it. I'll try and put together a bit of a video tonight if I can. But the principles of Harvard, of MIT, of UPenn, some of you saw it in Congress. Did, who saw it in Congress? So these principles of the, of the elite universities... In America, after October the 7th, I will completely allowed, not, um, not pro-Palestinian flags or free Gaza, but completely allowed banners that called for the genocide of the Jewish people. Do you understand, church, what this means? When America... That is the great ally to Israel when the principals of the highest universities will allow people to raise banners to the genocide of the Jewish people. And that's where we're at right now. And when I saw Congress... Trying to get these people to give a straight yes or no as to whether this was acceptable or not. And they wouldn't. None of them. They wouldn't give a straight yes or no that it was acceptable that you can actually allow that to happen in the high seats of learning in America. Israel's greatest ally. You see, friends, for some Christians, the Bible's got nothing to do with the world. They separate it from the world. It's just a book after all. But it's not. The Bible is ingrained into society. It changes people's lives. It changes nations. And what's written here is exactly what the church should be doing right now. Esther's falling on her face before the king. Crying out to the king for the deliverance of the Jewish people. Amen. The church is asleep. The church is asleep because in many churches they've replaced Israel. Israel isn't important anymore. But even more so, it's not. The church is replacing Christ. In the day and age that we live in, church is about church. Church is the answer. Church is your salvation. The things that go on, all the activities, that's what it's about. The only reason why we're here is to point to Christ. There is no other reason. The church will never be the answer. The church, as you look at through the entire New Testament, has fallen time and time again and will do so. But we're so consumed about ourselves, we can't see what's going on right now. Come along to our Christmas fair. We've got muffins, we've got this on, we've got that on, we've got a beer festival on. Come and join us. And you have people calling for the genocide of the Jewish people. I wept. When I saw people in Congress understanding the signs of the times, that there are actually people that can see what's going on, it caused me to weep that they can see it. There aren't many, we're so selfish. We are so selfish. There there aren't many. But there are some Esthers that right now are petitioning the throne, not for themselves, not even for their uncle, to the Jewish people. Because they've got enough nows to know if it doesn't go well with them, it ain't going to go well for the Christians. 
And now is the time, friends, to petition the throne of God, to get governments to wake up. I said this many times before, 80 years ago, our government knew right from wrong. We had a king that knew right from wrong. God help us. God help us. And the king extended the golden scepter to Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. Then she said, if it pleases the king, if I have found favour before him, and the matter seems proper to the king that I am pleasing in his sight, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in the king's provinces. Let me just show you something very briefly in Daniel chapter 2. Something that's going on today is such a lie. Daniel chapter 2 verse 41. When these principles of the highest learning seats in the free world were asked why they wouldn't actually stand against this thing, they said... The reason why they cannot take a stand is because they are all about inclusiveness. That the universities, the big law, the big God, the big thing now is inclusiveness. And so the members of Congress ask, does that inclusiveness extend to the Jewish people? And this is the great lie about inclusiveness. It's a lie. I've seen Goebbels. I, w I watched him on film when, when, he, when, he, when he told the, the, the foreign affairs officers of, of America and Britain it would be an unmitigated disaster to have a European war. He lied through his mouth. Lied to them. They lie. Folks, when are we going to get this? This whole inclusiveness thing is going to bring something in through the back door that says, yes, it's inclusive apart from two things. Number one, the Jews, and number two, Bible-believing Christians. In that you saw the feet of toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. Iron and clay don't stick together, folks. They never will. And before you get to the ten toes, and we're going to be looking at the ten sons of Haman. Before you get to the ten toes, you've got two feet that are made of a mixture. This is the buzzword today. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. The board... But the buzzword today is inclusiveness. Mix it all together. Put the iron and the clay together. The whole foundations of this statue, it's top heavy for one, and the foundations are pathetic. It, it's built to fail. It cannot stand. But before you even get to the ten toes, there's two feet of iron and clay. This inclusive mixture of things that are a total contradiction how can things stick together which which contradict one another completely i'll tell you why because it's demonic you see people talk about the far left and the far right there's a far left foot there's a far right foot the far left and the far right have different ideologies different politics completely but what do they have in common their hatred for the jews whether it's far left or far right, whether it's Stalin, whether it's Hitler, what do they have in common? Completely different ideologies, but what is it they want? Whether it's far left or far right, what do they want? They want world power. They want power and control. And the thing that they have in common is the hatred of the Jews, whether far right, far left. It's the same with the East and the West. The two legs, the two feet. Look at what's happening. The mixture that we see in society today. Ideologies, worldviews, politics, religions that in no way should be coming together. But they are. But they are. With all their contradictions, they're coming together. What is it that, that both the East and the West have been guilty of for the, for? 
The Lord knows only how long. The hatred of the Jewish people. Eventually this thing gives way to the ten toes. Eventually it does. This is spiritual church. Let me say this in black and white. Let me shout it out to you. This is not about Muslims. This is not about Muslims. This is spiritual. This has been going on since Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. When, the, when there's enmity between the Messiah seed, the seed of the, the woman and the seed of the... It goes from Cain to the sons of Cain to Nimrod to Babel from Egypt to Assyria from Babylon to Persia from the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the Roman Catholics, the Muslims, Hitler, Stalin. It's not about ideology. It's not about ethnicity. It's not about politics. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. We are in a war. Ephesians chapter 6. All of us have been brought up with this. That this is how we fight. But we've never really been in a fight. We don't really know what a fight is. Oh, we have little micro blips in our lives. That thank God the Lord gets us through. But we've never really been in a fight. But I tell you, if this continues the way it's going, we are going to be in the fight of our lives. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Hallelujah. Put on the full armour of God. Well, I don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't believe that the Holy Spirit's needed. I'm a cessationist. Are you really? Well, good luck to you in the last days. Good luck to you trying to do this without the Holy Spirit. Just good luck to you because you're going to need all the luck. Put on the full armour of God so that you may be able to stand against the firm schemes of the devil. Notice it's the devil. For we, we, for we struggle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Look at it. Look at how many... Nations throughout history have been involved in this. It, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Some are iron, some are clay. Some are this ideology, these politics, this skin colour. It's not about flesh and blood. It is against rulers, against powers, against world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armour of God. All of it. You're going to need it all. And what is the full armour of God? So that you may be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand. Stand firm, therefore. Stand firm. Having girded your loins with truth, Thy word is truth, Jesus said. Truth. The truth of thy word. Sanctify them, Lord, with truth. Thy word is truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, he who knew no sin became sin, so that through him we might become the righteousness of God. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, I've never known a time where there's so much bad news. Terrible news. We have the good news. In addition to all this, taking up the shield of faith. The shield of faith. 
And what is the shield of faith? What does it do? It, extin- it is able to extinguish all the flaming hours of the evil one. Above all, take up the shield of faith. 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 And we've had years of people telling you to have faith in faith. It isn't faith in faith. It's faith in Jesus. It isn't faith in becoming rich or faith in this thing or that. It's faith in Christ, not faith in faith. The shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. What's needed today is for the Word and the Spirit to come together in the hearts of men and women and children. The, 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 the grain offering, which is an offering of the Word of God, has the oil poured on it. The oil poured on the grain offering. It's the coming together of Word and Spirit. People that have just got Word, but they, do, they don't move in the Spirit. You can, you can tell them a mile off. People that are all spiritual that don't know the word, you can tell them a mile off. What's needed, friends, are, are, are those in the last days to take in the word of God and get filled with the Holy Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With this view, and on he goes... Do you see, friends, the importance of the hour? We aren't going to get through this without the armour of God. Let's go back to Esther, please. The book of Esther. We've got many things to see this morning. I know people right now that are waking up in the morning that they cannot believe this is happening. Cannot believe it's happening. So, verse 7, so King Azuris, or Xerxes, said to Queen uh, Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, remember 42 times, the Jew, the Jew, Behold, I have given the house of Haman to Esther, And him they have hanged on the gallows because he had stretched out his hand against the Jews. So even now the king is understanding what's going on here. Now you write to the Jews, see how many times, as you see fit in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet signet ring. For a decree which is written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's signet ring may not be revoked. So the king's scribes were called at the time in the third month, that is the month of Sidan, in the 23rd day, it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, the princes and the provinces, which extended from India to Ethiopia. 127 provinces that were given over to the genocide of the Jews. Given over. Let's keep up, folks. This is what this is about. The genocide of the Jewish people, right? 127 provinces. To every province according to its script, to every people according to their language, as well as the Jews according to their script and language. And he wrote in the name of the king Xerxes, and he sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horse, uh, horse riding on streets, sired by the royal stud. In them the king granted the Jews, who were in each and every city, the right to assemble and to defend themselves. To defend themselves. Church, how must we fight in these days? Have you thought this one through? Let me put it to you like this. From an Islamic point of view, you can take up arms, no problem. No problem. From a Jewish point of view, you can take up arms. If you're following the Old Testament, you can take up arms. From the point of view of the church, how do we fight in these days? I was at school in the 70s, at primary school, about 30 years after World War II. I sat there like a good boy, because I was a good boy. I was a good boy at primary school. Very good boy. 
I sat there cross-legged and the headmaster, Mr. Pedley, who's a very, very strict man, incredibly strict, one morning in assembly, he wanted to address bullying. So this was how we address bullying. If somebody hits you, hit them back twice as hard. <laughs> that was it. Lesson over. Now let's move on. That's what he said to do. If somebody hits you, hit them back twice as hard. Now, if you're anything like me, you probably don't like fighting. I don't like fighting. I've never liked fighting. But when you're bullied, day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month after month, this coil begins to get tighter and tighter and tighter inside of it. And one day, you unleash it, don't you? That's what happens. I was taught in, in my younger days, you don't punch at somebody's face, you punch through the face. If you see the face as an obstacle, you're not going to hurt them. You punch straight through the face. Now you, you're thinking, Tim, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the wrath of God. Because the wrath of God is coming. And when the wrath of God comes, he ain't just going to be coming at them. He's going to be going straight through them. We are called to fight the good fight. What is the good fight? You see, here we are in the society, in the church, where churches are taken up with bickering and gossip. And just all these little micro, micro things going on all the time. Silly things. Nip for tit for tat. Just silly, crazy stuff all the time. But Paul says, at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. And I don't want to get caught up in the tit for tat nonsense. That's not me, I don't want that. I want to fight the good fight. What is the good fight? It tells you. Fight the good fight of faith. That's what it is. Fight the good fight of faith. There's enough going on around the world, folks. Surely. Surely. I mean, are you bored? You know, are you bored? You look at what is going on around the world, folks. Fight the good fight of faith. We'll be looking at this more next year, God willing. So, he gives them the ability to defend themselves. He can't annul the first law. Does everybody understand that? He can't annul the first law. That the Jews are going to be attacked. He can't annul that. Because it's been written down, it can't be reversed. So, if he can't annul the first law, what does he do? He gives another law, and the other, the other law is passed that they can defend themselves. The wages of sin is death. It can't be annulled. It's a law that God put in place. If there is sin, somebody's got to die. It can't be annulled. So what happens? If it can't be annulled, and the wages of sin is death, then what does God do? He sends his only son to die in our place. But there's another law. The gift of God is eternal life. You see, the first law cannot be annulled, but through the death of Jesus, the gift of God is eternal life. He fights for us. So this is what it says. To, listen, to destroy, it's, this is going to alarm you, to destroy, to annihilate the entire army of any people or province which might attack them, including children and women, to plunder their spoil. This is the edict which is passed by the king. Anybody that stands against them, annihilate them. That's what he's saying. Men, women, children, the lot. Now, that's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult. Turn to Psalm 37. You will be awake through the sermon this morning by the grace of God. Psalm 37. Listen very carefully. Has anybody ever heard of the bombing of Dresden? Has anybody ever heard of Bomber Harris? Did anybody see the unveiling of his statue by the Queen Mother? When the Queen Mother unveiled 
Bomber Harris's statue, she, um, she, she flinched. I mean, I've never seen a, a, a queen flinch before. She, she was seriously disturbed because you've got English people shouting, murderers, 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 while, she, while Bomber Harris was being unveiled. Why? I'll tell you why. Because if you study Dresden out of the context of World War II, you will come to the conclusion that it was immoral and it was a war crime. If you study it outside of the context of World War II, it was immoral and it was a war crime. But if you study Dresden in the context of the absolute nightmare of World War II, they had no other choice. This is what you see in Esther at this point. People today, young people growing up in universities, don't understand war. They're so far removed from what war is, they think you can be fair in war. War is war, folks. As you, so you've got people writing these long essays about Dresden and how it was so morally wrong. And they never look at the context of World War II. They're gone in the head. They are gone in the head. 1933, Adolf Hitler, of course, comes to power, becomes the Chancellor. 1933. 1933. Did you know this? That in 1933, behind closed doors, and I hope to God this is going on right now, I pray this is going on right now, that behind closed doors, our government was already getting ready for a war. When they saw Hitler come to power, behind closed doors, not publicly, not out there in all the newspapers, they, they wanted to make Great Britain into an enormous floating aircraft carrier. Do you understand? It's an island. An enormous floating aircraft carrier. They put down 9,000 miles of concrete for new landing strips. So by the time the war starts, they were ready. They were ready. Behind closed doors, they were ready. Even with a prat like Chamberlain. He didn't stop them. They knew what was coming. This appeasement, you can't appease people like that, you never will. They were ready. 9,000 miles of concrete runways before the war even started Great Britain became a massive floating aircraft carrier how many people understand where we're at right now how many people are ready in 1938 we got crystal knacked which was the really was the beginning then they go into Austria and the, by the way the the Chancellor of Austria was an absolute animal. 1939, they go into Czechoslovakia. 1939, they got a pact between Russia and Germany. And people believe this stuff. They actually believe there's going to be a pact, that everything's going to be okay. We've got peace in our land. Don't worry, I've been to see him. He's ever such a nice man. Ask Eva. She thinks he's marvellous. 3rd of September, 1939. Obviously, they've invaded Poland. They bombed it. They bombed Poland. Blitzed it. They were so cruel to the Polish people. Anything down that line, between the two legs of the statue, anything down that line from Poland to the Serbs, anything down that line got it from the east and the west. They got it from both sides. Terrible place to live. Particularly after the war. They get liberated from, from the Nazis and they go straight into the frying pan of Stalin. The East and the West, there's no difference. It's a means to an end. Control, power. 1940, they invaded Denmark. Denmark just straight away capitulated. Norway, not so much. Not so much. They stood the ground for a while. I think it was about three months. These great big Norwegians. You ever seen a Norwegian? They're big people, right? They stood there, but even, the, even they couldn't stand against this thing. 10th of May, Chamberlain resigned. Hallelujah. In the name of God, leave. You remember that one? In the name of God, leave. 26th of, to the 26th of May to the 4th of 
uh, June the 4th, you have the whole Dunkirk thing, and yes, it was a miracle. And by the way, Esther means hidden. It's to, it means hidden miracles. Esther's all about hidden miracles, and there are many, as we'll see when we get to the end of this. July, June the 14th, you've got the fall of Paris. July the 10th to October the 31st, you've got the Battle of Britain. Remember what I talked about, the, the landing strips? Hey, the land seven years before people in this country understood where this was going to go. 9,000 miles of new landing strips. They were ready. They were ready. September the 7th to uh, May the 8th uh, to, to 1941, the Blitz. 40,000 people killed in the Blitz. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying here? 40,000 people killed in the Blitz. You don't hear a lot about the Blitz, do you? About the inhumanity? No, it's all about Dresden. <laughs> it's all about Dresden. June the 22nd, 1941. The fatal mistake. The image always is, is top heavy. Headstrong, top heavy. Feet of clay. Foundations, rotten, putrefied foundations with a heavy head. The hubris effect. They overstretched themselves, they tried to invade Russia. Goebbels knew it was a massive mistake. One year in, he knew. He knew by 1942 that the, 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 the Nazis would, would fail completely. He knew. Because they overstretched themselves. Because at the same time, at the same time as doing this, 1941, America joins in. Then in 1942, you got the 1C conference, which was the conference of the final solution. So at the same time, as this massive invasion upon the Soviet Union, 15,000 Jews a day were being slaughtered. Every day. Every single day. And at the end of the war, it's very clear what Hitler preferred, if he got the choice, was to, was to liquidate Europe of, of, of Jewish people rather than win the war. So every single day, 15,000 Jews were going to the ovens. But all we ever talk about is Dresden. What is going on? I tell you, when I was looking at this this week, I thought, what we see now in Gaza and what we see happening in Israel, there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new. The final solution was passed. Three, all, around about three and a half years, around about three and a half years, and in those three and a half years, Hitler, Hitler got around him a series of people, some of them not even that gifted, but they all had one thing in common. And you know what that one thing in common was, right? The hatred for the Jewish people. So, Bama Harris and the Americans, it wasn't just Bama Harris, they realised very quickly that Lancaster bombers and these great big American bombing machines, the accuracy was shocking. Terrible. They got no GPS or anything like that, no guided, nothing. It was shocking. 70% of the bombs were going off by five miles. They were a waste of time, really. It was more of a post tool than anything else. There's no way that you could take out a needle in a haystack. Do you understand? There's no way that you could do that. And so Bama Harris eventually, along with the Americans, realised that the only use of these bombers is for what they called a thousand bomber raid. A thousand bomber raid. So instead of trying to um, set their sights on small military targets, they put their sights on German cities. Why did they put their sights on German cities? The reasons are everything I've just told you. You imagine the amount of refugees 
flying around Europe trying to flee for their lives. Do you know how many slaves, how many forced labour camps there were at that time? Uh, apart from the 15,000 Jews every day. And yet the emphasis is upon the inhumanity of Dresden. Right three months before the war ended, when there was a clear path and Dresden was, was the place of culture, as you probably know. It was a place of the arts. It was the place where the intellectuals gathered together. There was lots of beautiful artwork there. There were also Jews, I've read the testimonies, Jews of people that had distant relations maybe grandfathers or, or so on, distant relations, so they were kind of slightly Jewish, they had their yellow stars on. They were Jew. The very next day, to be the final carriages that would go off, and they heard this roar coming over the skies, and to put it quite simply, they unleashed hell over Dresden. Make no mistake about it, they unleashed hell over Dresden. The, 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 the roads bubbled, the tarmac bubbled. They, they tried to get to the, the, the huge water containers. Many of them jumped in and bo were boiled alive. Dresden became a firestorm. Do you know what a firestorm is? When the wind gets up and the oxygen gets sucked out so there's no oxygen whatsoever. And a few hours later, another, another load of bombers came. A few hours later, another load of bombers came. And the next day, another load of bombers came. Dresden. If you think Nagas uh, Hiroshima was the worst thing that happened in World War II, it wasn't. It was Dresden. The whole infrastructure going down 20, 30 feet was gone. Why did they do it? Why did they do it? Why did they do this? The same reason you see in Esther. People don't understand war, folks. There's an awful lot of distractions this morning, I've got to say. It doesn't surprise me that there's an awful lot of distractions. It really doesn't. Not at all. There are too many people today that have not looked at history and they don't understand what war is. Let's go back to Esther. The entire army of any people or province which might attack them, including children and women, to plunder their spoil. On one day, in all the provinces of King Xerxes, the thirteenth day, the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, a copy of the edict to be issued as law in each and every province was published to all the people, so that the Jews would be ready to this day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers hastened and, and empowered by the King's command went out riding on the royal steeds and the decree was given out at the citadel of Sushi, the capital. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white. <laughs> That's the Israeli flag, isn't it? Yeah. Blue and white with a large crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Sushi shouted and rejoiced. For the Jews, see how this keeps coming up? For the Jews, there was light and gladness and joy and honour in each and every province, in each and every city where the king's commandment and his decree arrived. There was gladness and joy for the Jews, a feast and a holiday, and many among the peoples of the land became Jews, for the dread of the Jews had fallen upon them. You always back the winner. You always back the winner. In the 1980s, people were Liverpool fans. In the 1990s, there were Manchester United fans. Now, of course, they're all Manchester City fans. People always back a winner. And that's what they were doing there. They, they were backing a winner. And that's what you see happening right now, by the way. That's why you see people right now beginning to uh, 
look at things that you would never think in a million years they would pick up and look at because they sense, they smell. There's a smell in the air of who the winner is. But let me tell you, you don't need me to tell you, you just read the last part of the, of the Bible, there's only going to be one winner. And we've sang about him this morning, and his name is Jesus. Esther chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day, when the king's command and edict were about to be executed, on the day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, it was turned to the contrary, so that the Jews themselves gained the mastery over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand before them, for the dread of them had fallen on all the peoples. Even all the princes of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and those who were doing the king's business assisted the Jews, because the dread of Mordecai had fallen on them. Indeed, Mordecai was great. By the way, it sounds to me, when I read about all this, it sounds to me... It's a picture of the millennial reign. It's a picture of the millennial reign when finally, friends, finally, we will go up to Jerusalem. Yeah. Everybody will sit under their own vine. And we will, there's two uh, feasts that we'll celebrate. We'll fel- celebrate Passover and we'll celebrate Tabernacles together with the Jewish people. Indeed, Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame spread throughout all the provinces for the man Mordecai became greater and greater. Thus the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. And the citadel in Susha, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Now listen very carefully. There is a scroll, the scroll of Esther, and in the scroll of Esther, you have written in that scroll all the names of the ten sons of Haman. Okay? Ten in the Bible is a significant number. There are ten toes to the image. There's ten kings at the end in the book of Revelation. The number ten is a very significant prophetic number. The ten sons of Haman are mentioned here and it's also mentioned that they are killed. Listen very carefully. Well, don't listen too carefully because I won't be able to pronounce them. (laughs) But Parshandatha, the first one, Dalphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmashta, Arisai, Aridai, and Vyazatha. Did quite well there, I thought. (laughs) These are the ten sons of Haman. The son of Hamadatha, the Jews' enemy, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. So uh, the Jewish people had an uh, incredible victory, including the ten sons of Haman, okay? Man, did you get them things up, by the way? Just bear with me a sec. On the day that the number of those who were killed at the citadel in Susha was reported to the king, The king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men. Listen very carefully, don't switch off. The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman. Did you see that? They'd all been killed, okay, at the citadel in Susia. What then have they done in the rest of the king's province? What's happening? Now, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. And what is your further request? It shall also be done. Listen very carefully. Then said Esther, If it pleases the king, listen, let tomorrow, let tomorrow also be granted to the Jews who are in Susha to do according to the edict of today, Let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. They're already dead. They're already dead. But he says, let tomorrow, let those ten sons of Haman be hung. So the king commanded that it should be done so. An edict was issued, come up Mandy, an edict was issued and Haman's ten sons were hung. Esther called for the hanging, for the hanging in the gallows of the ten sons of Haman, even though they'd already been killed. 
And here it is. Here it is. In the Nuremberg trials, 10. And by the way, there was going to be 11. Goering was going to be hung. He was going to be hung. But miraculously, or rather unmiraculously, somehow he managed, somebody gave him some cyanide. He took his life the day before. Eleven were set to be hung. And somehow, you imagine they would have been stripped naked. Every orifice would have been checked for cyanide, I promise you. But somehow, Goering managed to take his life before this point. Which took it to ten. Ten. Yeah, I know you're thinking that's coincidence. You wait till you hear this. If you think that's coincidence, you ain't seen nothing yet. In the Nuremberg trials, these men appealed for amnesty. <laughs> right? Yes, it's true. Because of course they were all innocent people. And they deserved amnesty. They started the appeal in 1945. Because they appealed for amnesty, this trial dragged on, listen, to 1946. Not 1945, 1946. Here's the list of them. Hans Frank. Anybody ever heard of Hans Frank? He was known as the Butcher of Poland. If you have any clue as to the cruelty that happened in Poland, you'll understand he was one of the sons of Haman. Wilhelm, well, Wilhelm Frick, he was the butcher of the Czechs. Alfred Jodl, he was the chief military advisor. They, these men were all dogs. They were beasts. They were shocking people. By the way, none of them liked one another. None of them got on. None of them trusted one another. But somehow they were stuck together as iron and clay. Ernest Kaltenbrunner. He was an SS Nazi monster. Weinhelm Keitel. Adolf Hitler said he was as loyal as a dog. Hitler said he, he, he hasn't got much going on up there, but he's as loyal as a dog. He confessed Christ just before they hung him. And he was very penitent. Joachim van, van Ribbentrop. He was the chief of foreign affairs and he was massively involved in the final solution. Alfred Rosenberg. He was the greatest thief in the history of the world. He took more Jewish art than anybody else had ever done. He was also the head of Nazi theory and massively involved in the final solution. Fritz Saukel. Fritz Saukel was the slave master of Europe. This was the man behind all forced labour camps. He was an absolute monster and an animal. And thank God they got him. All of these tried to escape in the Alps. You would not believe the places they went. How they found them is just unreal. But they found them. Many of them, of course, killed themselves. Goebbels, who was probably uh, the most powerful man next to Hitler. Goebbels had five children. Five beautiful children. Goebbels made sure that all five of those chil children took cyanide, his wife took cyanide and he took cyanide. Of course Himmler and many of, the, many of the, the most vile of them managed to take their lives. Hitler, as you know, took his life. There's a reason why Hitler took his life and we'll come to this in a minute. You won't, honestly, this is just incredible. Um, oh my goodness, what's his name? From Italy. Mussolini. 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 Do, do, do you remember what they did to Mussolini? They hung him, you know. They hung him, even though he was already dead. They hung him there for days. There's a reason for that. Hitler wanted to make sure that never happened to him. And there's a reason. Arthur Zeiss Inquart. These are all notoriously... So he was the... He, so when, when Hitler took 
Austria, he put in power as a chancellor a man that was obsessed with the annihilation of the Jewish people. So of course he aided Hitler very quickly to get rid of all the Jews from Austria and also Poland. He was massively involved in the liquidation of the Jewish people in Poland. Then we finally get this last guy, his name is Julius Stryker. Julius Stryker. Who was he? He was the... F listen. Listen. At the beginning of this, I told you about what was going on in the top universities right now. How the principals were allowing banners to fly calling for what? Calling for the genocide of the Jews, right? Okay. This man was hung for one reason. For calling. He wasn't involved in the war. You get this. This man did all his damage before the war started. In fact, the Nazis themselves thought he was so utterly unhinged they would have nothing to do with it. This man was more of a Jew baiter than anybody before. He was the Jew hater of Jew haters. And he wrote a publication called Dyer Sturmer. Dyer Sturmer, which means the attacker. The attacker. And in um, this man was... He he's very clever in some ways, I suppose. He combined pornography with the demonization of Jewish people. Because he knew that the working class men of, of Germany would buy it just for the porn alone, you see. So what he would do is combine pornography of Aryan women with Jews portrayed as snakes, raping them and stuff like that. That's what he did. So... This thing at its height was selling 600,000 copies a day. In this um, newspaper, and you can see the copies, you can see, see the front pages today, it, it demonised Jewish people on a level that had never happened before. All this was before the war started. So that when the war began, all of the Jewish civilians had been totally conditioned Look at what's going on right now. For, I'm not saying this for no reason. I'm not saying this because it's an interesting fact. Look at what's going on right now. Look at what's just happened in Harvard, in MIT. Why are people waking up to this? Because the damage was done before the war began. The people were already anti-Semitic to the core. And this man, Julius Stryker, was right behind it. He wrote three children's books. He didn't just write books for adults. There's, there's one children's book where the Jew was portrayed as a paedophile, standing there with a long coat saying, come on children, come and eat my sweeties and, and just come and follow me. He, he, he portrayed them as a poisonous toadstool for children, so that children can understand, even though this mushroom looks completely harmless, you must understand it's deadly poisonous. All this for the children. All this for the children. He was horrible. I, I, don't, I don't know what words to use. He was vile. All of the others of the ten, the ten sons here, the ten Nazis, were, were directly involved in the war in one way or the other. This man, he did his damage before. Yeah. Those that have an ear to hear, hey? Those that have an ear to hear, let them hear. He was by far, when all of these people were put on trail, many of them trembled like jelly and uh, you probably know that they hired a hangman that had no, no clue how to hang people. They hired a man that deliberately made the rope short so that they wouldn't snap the neck, so that it actually took time for them to die. He even made the trap door small so that they would smash their head on the way through and they'd, 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 they'd be in some pain at least for a few minutes. So the last one to go was Julius Stryker. Julius Stryker. These men were hung on the gallows at the time of Hoshana Rabbah. Hoshana Rabbah, the, the final day of the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, it's called the Final Judgment. They were hung 
during the days of the final judgment. Listen to this. This is simply unreal. When they asked him, what are your last words? He turned around, because there's lots of witnesses and newspapers and stuff that were witnessing this event. Listen. And he cried out, he shrieked out, Purim Fest 1946. <laughs> he cried out, the Feast of Purim 1946. Some of you are not quite getting what this means, are you? Julius Stryker understood Purim. He understood Esther. They knew about Esther. They knew about Haman. I'll show you in a minute. Hitler was terrified of the book of Esther. They all were. They were terrified because the book of Esther tells you that no matter how dark it gets for the Jewish people, in the end, it always goes sour. So he cries out, Purim Fest 1946, because he realises he's one of the ten sons of Haman. Do you understand? You've got the ten up there. The last of the ten cries out, this is a fulfilment. Was it the demon in him? But it's even more bizarre. In the scroll of Esther, when it comes to the ten sons of Haman, there are three Hebrew letters that are written lowercase, very, very, very small. There is the Tav, the Shin, and the Zion. The Tav, the Shin, and the Zion. When you add together the Tav, the Shin, and the Zion, guess what number it comes to? 1946. This man cried out, Purim Fest, 1946. The oldest manuscript of Esther, it goes back to the Middle Ages, around about that time. You've got this gallows, you can actually see it's kind of set out like a gallows with Haman at the top there and the ten sons with three distinct Hebrew letters much smaller than the others. You add them together along with a major letter, an oversized vav, and you get 1946. So get this. The last of these sons of Haman, cries out, this is the fulfilment of the ten sons of Haman. Effectively, that's what he was crying out. It happened on the 16th of October at the time of the final judgment in the Jewish feasts. Hashanah Rabbah, the final judgment. He who touches you, touches the apple of his eye. Let me come to a close this morning. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 3.15. I've read Hitler's speech from 1944. Quite boring actually. <laughs> but in Ecclesiastes 3.15. By the way, Mein Kampf, my struggle, is the same as Jihad. You understand? Struggle, struggle, struggle. That's why they read Mein Kampf. Because although they have completely different ideologies, completely different skin colour, completely different ethnicities, come from completely different places, it is a spirit. Listen very carefully. This is the incredible thing. There are so many Christians that don't understand pattern prophecy. They don't understand that history repeats itself. So many Christians don't understand that. You need to understand even the enemy understands it. Even Stryker understood it. Even Hitler understood it. Hitler understood that history repeats itself. So in 1944, what happened in 1944? D-Day. They were losing the war on the Eastern Front. They'd lost virtually. In 1944, Hitler makes a speech on the radio on January the 30th. And part of that speech is this. The, dev the devastating Jewish king could sell... Oh, this is what he's saying would happen if they lose. What will happen if we lose? The devastating Jewish king could celebrate the destruction of Europe in a second triumphant Purim festival. <laughs> Hitler knew... 
Hitler knew that if they lost this, in effect, history would repeat itself and the Haman would be hung and the ten sons of Haman would be hung. What did Esther say? Even though they're dead, I want them hung tomorrow! Tomorrow! And Hitler knew he was Haman. Do you know that? Hitler knew he was Haman. And so he made sure that he didn't hang, shot himself through the head. Because there's no way he wanted to be hung to fulfill this thing. History repeats itself. Listen to what Ecclesiastes 3.15 says. That which is has already has been already. That which is today has already been in the past. Julius Stryker was already doing what they're doing in the universities today. And that which will be has already been. That which is coming has already been. The enemy understands it. Julius Stryker understood it. He actually did an article on Purim in his newspaper. He understood the power of this book, Esther. He understood it. The enemy understands it. The enemy trembles more over it than some Christians do. Hitler understood he was Haman. And he understood that if they lost, there would be a second Purim. Isn't this incredible? What, what have we got to do, folks? I'm not trying to sensationalise things. I'm really not. And by the way, I did not want to preach this. I promise you, man, I didn't want to preach this message. I really didn't. I just wanted to finish off on a nice high and go into Christmas, you know. I really did. I really did. And the Lord just... Look, this is what it says in, in Second Chronicles 7. It says, If I shut up the heavens, that there is no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, does anybody even understand what locusts are? Do you understand what they are in the Bible? What are locusts? What, what are they? It's the same spirit. When the locusts devour the land, and if I send pestilence among my people... If my people don't do an Esther, if my people don't do an Esther, if my people are only concerned about their own deliverance, if my people don't do an Esther, there's no hope. There is no hope. There really is no hope. There's no hope for your children. There's no hope for your grandchildren. No hope. None whatsoever. If the, the church cannot find at this time a, a call to prayer, not just corporately, but in our own private prayer, I think maybe that one counts more than anything, in our own private time that we actually call upon the living God. Because... We can't do this in our own strength. Remember, we looked at this a few weeks ago. Esther didn't say to Mordecai, Don't worry, Mordecai. I'll just let down my hair. I'll do the whole L'Oreal thing in front of the king. He'll see how beautiful I am and he won't be able to resist me. No. Esther didn't trust in her beauty. The church can't trust in its natural ability to, to be movers and shakers in this time. We couldn't shake a flea. We have no strength. Like Jehoshaphat said, we have no strength and we don't know what to do. The church has to admit that. We're not winning. You can have all the posters you want. All the uh, um, visions... You want in the foyer of the church, the church is not winning. We have no strength. The Esther understood that. She understood it. Don't think you can get away with your natural beauty. You cannot. 
The battle belongs to the Lord. This is not a fight against flesh and blood. This is principalities and powers clashing, clashing right now. I saw footage just yesterday of a, this Jewish girl walking through some street somewhere and two ladies behind her, all with their, their, with their stuff on, shouting her, shouting her. She, she, this, is, this happened a day ago. And they grab her and they smash her and they punch her and they punch her unconscious on the floor. Things are happening at an alarming rate. And church, honestly... If you can't see what Julius Stryker is up to, it's already too late.